Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, my first time in Bengaluru. And um, uh, the, the facilities of this uh, place are uh, really excellent for uh, having discussions and uh, uh, performing uh, nice uh, research work. And uh, I hope uh, you will enjoy uh, the, the, the talks that I give. Now, wh what I'm going to do, since um, as uh, was introduced, uh, I'm a string theorist, and uh, in string theory, the main language that we use is uh, quantum field theory. I cannot assume that uh, people in this audience know quantum field theory, so we will have to suppress uh, the knowledge and talk effectively about uh, various uh, effective concepts. Um, and the goal would be to show how it is natural that uh, problems in cluster algebras uh, arise in, uh, in string theory, and in particular in uh, brain physics. So I'll uh, just... Um, Uh, use this word that uh, so some of you are uh, not familiar with, maybe you've seen this uh, term. And um, uh, again, in order to understand a brain, we would need to know uh, quantum field theory. And so instead of trying to do that, uh, I'll just uh, present a very simple uh, concept which would translate to a language of quivers and, and the thing is that uh, equivers are universal. Uh, they provide the connection point, right? So uh, people in this audience are comfortable with notions of quivers. Uh, in string theory, we are comfortable with notions of quivers. This audience does, is not familiar with quantum field theory, so I'll not talk about that, but I'll uh, make uh, as quick steps as possible to enter into quivers. And then from then, we could uh, have some uh, discussions. So uh, brains and gauge theories and uh, when I say gauge theories, um, I, I mean um, that's, that's one um, uh, word which will be, uh, at least in this set of lectures, synonymous to uh, notions of uh, quivers, right? So we could, um, instead of saying brains and gauge theories, we will say brains and quivers. Now, um, so uh, the, to start, um, what we would uh, need to do is to um, talk about a uh, um, right, a, a string theory has uh, 9 plus 1 uh, space-time dimensions. And the brains are uh, sub-spaces. Um, R P comma one in these nine plus one dimensions, and um, when we will have some uh, several objects, and let me introduce them now. Uh, and I'll actually, I'll use the uh, colors. We will have three types of brains. Uh, which are, uh, I'll, I'll uh, just call them, uh, will be the blue, brain, which uh, lives in directions, uh, well, let, let me put a table. So 
So here are the uh, collection of dimensions of space-time. And we will take the uh, blue brain to fill uh, the first five spatial directions and the time. Okay, so this would be the blue brain. And uh, then I'll have the green. which will be uh, filling uh, those directions. And f finally, I'll have the red one, uh, and this uh, brain will uh, fill uh, these directions, again, 0, 1, and 2 but uh, those three directions, seven, eight, and nine. Okay, so um, you could uh, call this a five brain because it fills those five directions. This is a three brain because it fills those three directions, and this is another five brain. Um, And let me raise here, write it in green. Now, um, at, at any point, um, if you have any question, please stop me. Um, the more questions, the happier the discussion will be. And um, uh, it will give me an idea of uh, what uh, topics to emphasize. So uh, this is our brain system. The next thing that we will do is to uh, look at such a brain system by uh, projections. Uh, in various directions. Um, and, and the reason that uh, we do that is because um, we have uh, nine spatial dimensions. Uh, me, myself, I, I can only draw two-dimensional uh, pictures, not even three-dimensional pictures, but certainly not nine-dimensional pictures. So, uh, the, uh, so what we are going to do is to uh, just draw simple projections which will show us how such a system looks like. And so I'll, I'll, I'll pick a coordinate system here now, which says that um, along the uh, horizontal direction, I'll draw the six uh, uh, direction. And along the vertical, I'll pick one of those three, four, or five directions. So if I uh, take such a projection, uh, then the, um, the blue a brain uh, stretches along the uh, three, four, five directions, and it's point-like along the six direction. Right. So, so when I say this symbol here, I, what I mean is that the brains feel all of those directions, and they are point-like in the remaining directions. So I would draw uh, such a brain like this. And if I have several of them, they can be drawn in different positions. Right? So it's point-like. I just need to provide uh, four points which tell me where the blue brain is located along the six directions. Uh, we are going to take the green brains to be a finite in extent. Um, so here, instead of of an X, I'll, I'll just draw it as an interval. 
And uh, let me add uh, one more point that uh, green brains In brains and on five brains. So I can have a configuration where uh, the green brain will end on the five brain like that or on both, both sides. Or like here. And I can have several copies within a given interval. Okay? So this is going to be uh, such a, a brain system. This is a semi-infinite uh, interval. On this side, it just goes uh, to infinity along six. Here's just an interval. And I can also have a semi-infinite uh, line uh, on the other side, okay? So this is um, the brain uh, system, and now let's introduce the uh, third type of brain into this picture. So the, um, the red brain is point-like in six and point-like in those three, four, five di directions, and therefore in this projection, uh, it will look like a point. So I'll just denote it by an X here. I can put a brain here. I can put it over here. It's a set of brains like that. Okay? Any questions so far? You want to put them on top of each other? Yes. And not continuation, but they can uh, align, and then the distance between them will be zero. Yes, so you could have, yes. Certainly, certainly. It's, a, um, it's going to be a, a, a state in the corresponding uh, physical system. So all um, possible positions are allowed. Um, since the a three brain is ending on the five brain, its position in the seven, eight, nine directions are fixed to be the position of the five brain. However, in the three, four, five directions, they are free to move. So I can have um, in, uh, um, so, so now, now I can introduce, introduce the word of uh, space of all possible positions that those three brains can have, and this is going to be the modelized space of configuration. Yes. It's actually going to be hyperkähler. So there is a modulized space. Of uh, a three brain positions. Um, and w what we are interested in physics is to actually understand what is this model space. So one of our goals is to compute
And actually, it's, it's going to turn out to be a symplectic singularity. There was a question. Yes? Yeah, they are fine, yes, because they can extend. Um, uh, in this case, there is no natural origin, right? Because um, I, I still have not said where I place the origin. I can place the origin over here or over here. So there is translation invariance. And actually, using this translation variance, I can remove one of the positions. I'm going to measure relative positions rather than an overall position. Also, uh, for the blue brains, um, there's no natural origin. I can choose it to be anywhere because of the fact that I have translation variance. <coughs> Was another question? Write bigger, okay. Yes, I'll write bigger. Uh, more questions. So the next point that uh, we will do is to translate this um, um, brain setup into a, a quiver. And the type of quiver that we will have is one of those which are called the uh, A-type uh, Nakajima uh, quiver varieties. So what I'm going to do is to uh, divide, so uh, the, the, the blue brains give me a natural um, split of the six directions into a collection of intervals. <clears throat> and so what I'm going to do is to assign to each interval, each finite interval, Uh, is going to be assigned with a node in the quiver. So, uh, since in this picture I have um, um, three blue brains, I'll have two nodes. Two nodes for each blue brain. I'm going to have a, an edge an edge in the quiver so I have one node one a brain which is the center brain and so it will connect the two nodes this is the edge that I drew I will also have uh, the outer um, brains, and they will have edges associated to them. And I'll uh, draw them, those edges as vertical. And finally, uh, for um, okay, so so the next step is um, for each green. Green brain, I add, uh, each, in, each green brain adds a, a, a label to the um, to the node. And by this, what I mean is that uh, we are just uh, 
are going to count the number of green brains and assign the number in each segment to the node number, right? So in this particular example, uh, by now we already have one, two, three, four green brains. So I'll put the number four. First interval. In the second interval, I have one of them, so I'll put a one. So, um, so it's not really adding a label, but it's the brain number. So the brain number Uh, in each interval is the uh, node number of the corresponding node. Finally, I need to take into account the, the red brains and the semi-infinite green brains and um, uh, for this uh, reason, actually, I'll, I'll add one more. Let's add one more blue brain. And let's add one more semi-infinite uh, green brain, like that. Let's add two of them. And I, I need to now add one more node. The number of green brains in the corresponding segment now is one. And there's going to be a corresponding edge. And those are going to be framing. So let me explain the framing. So the red brains add framing. in the quiver. And then node number, the brain number is the uh, node number. So in this particular example, in the first segment, I have two of them, so I'll put the two. Uh, here are two more, so two here. And here I have none, so there will be a zero. And semi-infinite green brains add to the framing and so um, here I have two of them so I'll have two more and over here I have again two so uh, there will be two more okay so now um, we are, we are done with, uh, I can draw now any brain system with these three types of brains. And using the rules that we specified, I can construct a quiver, which is a framed A-type quiver. Yes. Ah, so uh, strictly speaking, this is a, yeah, we, we, we abuse the word quiver. These are more like graphs because they are un the edges are unoriented. And, and now uh, I'm, I'm going to have the, uh, the next uh, point. Uh, so, so I'll put arrows in the next comment, but before that I'm going to stop and ask if there are any questions. 
Yes. Uh, so, some of the brains, so the blue brains would give the edges of the quiver, yes? Yes, they would. Uh, so this edge here would correspond to this blue line here, right? Because uh, it will... Uh, so the, the node number here contains two contributions. One comes from the number of red brains, and the other comes from the number of semi-infinite green brains. And between these green brains and these green brains, there is a blue one, which goes to this edge. Okay? More questions? Yes? Number of? So the, the, um, the known number of the circles would be given by the number of green brains. And the node numbers of the square nodes will get two contributions. One from counting number of red brains and another coming from counting number of semi-infinite uh, green brains. Yes. Yes, right, yeah. So uh, let's do an example. Uh, let's suppose that I'm given this quiver. And the number of nodes here is n minus 1. Then the corresponding brain system will consist of number of edges here is uh, n. So I'm going to draw n blue brains. And I'm going to place green brains in each of those segments. Uh, so since I have n blue brains, there will be n minus 1 segments corresponding to those n minus 1 nodes. And in each uh, interval, I will have precisely one green brain. And there are two ways I can represent this. So there is an ambiguity on the last two guys, because there is a sum. So there are two ways I can do it. I can either place one brain here, one brain here, which is my more um, preferred way of doing it. Or I can um, also draw the other brain system. And put semi-infinite. Both of them will give the squiver up there. So they are allowed to pass each other. To, uh, when you say pass, they, they, can, they are free to move in the three, four, five directions as at will. Right? So they are going to be moduli, they are going to be coordinates on the moduli space of all such brain configurations. Uh, but it's not encoded in the quiver. So the quiver only encodes the, node num the brain numbers uh, and not the positions themselves. This will be extra information that is uh, going to be used once I give meaning to this quiver. Right? So up to now, what we are doing is to set up the combinatorial data of the quiver. 
More questions? Yes, of course. Yes, right. So you could. So that's very good. Very good. Thank you. So let me uh, talk about uh, brain creation. Given um, uh, given such a brain system. Um, I can have uh, two possible ways for the green and the blue brains to be placed along the sixth direction. This is one of them, but I can also take this brain and move it uh, past uh, the blue brain. When I do that, Uh, this uh, green brain, which was there, uh, is going to uh, disappear. So uh, if I take, uh, if I start with this configuration and end with this configuration, I'll call this brain annihilation. On the other hand, if I start from this configuration, move this to the other side, I'll get the brain creation. So this is a, a phenomenon in brain physics. I will not explain how it comes about, but this is um, a nice feature. And so what I can do in this system, I can take a brain here, red one, I can pull it all the way to infinity, then I'll just be left with semi-infinite green one. Uh, but on the other hand, I can just move it inside, and then I'll get this configuration. And those two configurations are equivalent. So I can do this, I can do it on the other side, Pull, pulling this out will create a brain, and then pulling it to infinity will give me this configuration. So all of these configurations are equivalent. Any questions? Yes, they would give the same quivers. They, they would give the same a uh, uh, physical system. Okay. So, um, uh, there is a, a moduli space of uh, brains, or maybe green brains, between the blue, the blue brains, and we will call this modular space the Coulomb branch. And the, the reason for this name, uh, the Coulomb branch, um, goes back to a collection of uh, developments in uh, physics, uh, starting from uh, late 70s, I believe. <coughs> and um, uh, by now, uh, this is the common name that uh, physicists are using for this uh, modular space of brain uh, configurations. So we will use this thing. I, I, I will not try to argue with the choice of the name, even though we could try to debate about that. <coughs> Soon we will also introduce another modular space. But let's, for now, just uh, count the dimension. The dimension of this space is uh, just the uh, sum 
and, and here actually I should uh, um, specify that this is the quaternionic dimension. So um, it's uh, four times the real dimension of uh, the moduli space. It's the sum of uh, node numbers in the quiver. And when I say node numbers, I, I mean the circle. I'm not going to, uh, con to have a contribution from the um, square nodes. So in this example, I have uh, six different segments. Each such segment contributes four real dimensions to the moduli space. So this, the Coulomb branch of this quiver is going to be six, of dimension six. Now, out of the... Uh, of uh, four directions, or, or, or four dimensions for each a green brain. Uh, only three are visible, are positions of the brain. There is uh, one more, uh, which is uh, not visible. And I, I will just settle for this. Right, so um, the, the, the ability of the brain to be anywhere along the three, four, five, five, four, five directions is going to uh, present three different moduli for each brain. And there's one more, which is not a position anymore. It's, it's more hidden and we will not discuss where it comes from, okay? <clears throat> Question so far? So the next point that uh, we will do is to uh, translate uh, the uh, this this uh, graph sometimes we call this graph the n equal to two quiver let me write it like that let me write it uh, n equals 4 quiver. Into uh, an n equal to 2 quiver. Or I can just uh, remove this prefix, just a quiver. And, and now I'm going to defer from uh, yesterday. Uh, Discussion. So in yesterday's discussion, the, the um, loops in the quivers were not allowed, and bidirectional arrows were not allowed. And I'm going to allow for both because that's what the brain system tells me. So, um, so I'm going to do that for each circle node. in the n equals 4 quiver, uh, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to have, so it's going to look like a circle. I'm going to draw a circle and a loop. For each edge, I'm going to draw a bidirectional arrow. And 
and for each square node, I'm just going to uh, draw a square. No loop there. So this, given this graph here, we are now going to draw the quiver da data the way Kaver wants us to do, right? Now I have arrows and I, have, I can talk about um, morphisms. So I'm going to draw the quiver as four, one, and one. There's going to be a loop in each case. And there's going to be uh, bidirectional arrows. I translated this graph, and I'll, I'll also put the, no, the square node numbers, 4, 2, and 2. Any questions? Um, now I'm going to um, introduce a super potential. Which is uh, typically uh, denoted W. And uh, the way I will write down this uh, superpotential is as the sum of uh, edges. Over loops. Right, so each edge has um, is connecting between two nodes, and it, it's not really important whether those are square nodes or circle nodes. So uh, I'm going to draw it like this. There are two nodes, and um, there's going to be a, a closed path, which starts from the node, it goes back, and passes through the loop. And there's going to be an opposite direction. Uh, with the loop of the other side. <clears throat> okay. Soon, what we are going to do is to assign a matrix, a rectangular matrix for each uh, arrow in the quiver, and then we will introduce the moduli space of uh, all possible paths subject to equivalence relations. <coughs> but I need this uh, super potential. It's very crucial to have this one in order to construct the moduli space, another moduli space. So we we saw the Coulomb branch without giving a precise definition. At the moment, the Coulomb branch is just the motion of the green brains between the blue brains. Then there is the Higgs branch. Which is the hyperkeller quotient. Uh, given by the quiver data. So this is the, um, the usual notion 
of uh, the the uh, question that I get from uh, uh, writing down the Nakajima Quiver variety, uh, constructing a moment map, taking into account the relations, and um, uh, dividing by equivalence relations. Yes. What does not play a role? Ah, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, so I, I need also... To, there's going to be a similar contribution. Um, so, um, let, let, let's put a comment which addresses your question. This includes square nodes also. But uh, with the loops which are set to zero. So if I have an edge between um, a circle node and a square node, I will get one contribution only, not two of them. The, the other contribution, which is associated to the loop, will just be zero. Um, now, um, I could also introduce dependence on loops that are associated to the, uh, to the squares. This is certainly a physical, uh, has a physical meaning. They, they correspond to masses in the corresponding uh, gauge theory. But I do not want to enter into this, and so we just set them to zero. Yeah, so the sign, the sign uh, does not seem to play a, a crucial role. Um, when the, so, so those nodes, um, in general, you see that they have a valence three, uh, two edges associated to blue brains and one uh, edge associated to the red brain. Uh, and so, um, the, the sign is ambiguous in this case. So we just need to pick um, a particular convention and just stick to it. <coughs> this is some reasonable uh, convention that I'm, I'm using. More questions? Yes. They don't have the loops, you say. <clears throat> the, uh, the Nakajima Quiver variety uh, contains a moment pop, which is uh, three-dimensional. There is an SU2, and the moment map is a triplet under this SU2, right? So, um, the... Uh, um, wh what we're going to do is to uh, take this moment map, triplet moment map, and two of the equations are going to give, be given by the superpotential. So I'll need the loops. And they are equivalent with the loops to the Nakajima Quiver varieties. So we can do an example. <clears throat> Let's actually do uh, two examples. Well, let, let me first uh, give uh, uh, the description in terms of matrices. So the hyperkähler quotient. I'm going to uh, uh, introduce for each. arrow, a matrix 
so um, the arrow will look like this. It, it starts from one node, which has a node number N1, and it ends on another node with the node number N2. Uh, so I introduce a matrix, um, let's call it A, uh, which has dimensions N1 by N2, and each entry is a complex entry. Right, so the rectangular matrix with the N1 times N2 uh, complex entries. <coughs> so as a result, um, we see that uh, there is one matrix uh, from uh, this node to the other. There is another one going the opposite way, another matrix for the loop, and so on. Right? So we have all of these matrices. And uh, the modular space, I'm going to introduce an equivalence relation. That um, say um, G1 um, in SLN1, GLN1, and G2 in GLN2, and I would say that A is equivalent to uh, G1, A, G2, minus 1. Yes? Yeah, so, we, we, uh, so um, using, well, using these matrices, I can now explicitly write the superpotential as a trace of a product of three um, matrices. So it will be a sum over cubic terms, traces of cubic terms. Each cubic term is a matrix. It's, so three matrices. So it's trilinear. One loop and two bidirectional. Two arrows along the same edge. <coughs> so, um, so let's let's make an example. So, given uh, such part of the quiver n1 and n2, I'll call uh, this guy a, this guy b, and the first loop I'll call. Phi 1, the second loop I'll call phi 2, and now the superpotential is going to be the trace of the um, matrix starting from A, uh, then uh, what, what was the convention that I chose? So first A, then B. Phi 1 minus uh, the other convention, so A phi 2. <coughs> and um, because of the trace condition, I'm only having traces. Uh, the, the, these Contributions to the superpotential are cyclic. I can change the order in a cyclic way. Any questions? So now I can see that the superpotential is invariant under the equivalence relation that I wrote uh, above. Um, 
More questions? I see, yeah. So we, we will do now an example to address your question also. Right? So, um, uh, we will now take the, uh, the following system, two blue brains, one green stretching all over, like that, and I'm going to take N red brains, like this. From, from what we uh, so, said so far, I will write down the following graph. One and n. Is it clear how to, I move from the brain system to this? Okay. Next step, I'm going to write down the, the other type of quiver, the n equal to 2 quiver. <laughs> so then it's going to have one loop like that, the node number is still one, uh, square node number n, and the bidirectional hours. From here I write down the superpotential, so let's call them names. I'll call this guy phi, and uh, here I'll call it uh, u and d. So the superpotential is uh, phi, phi is one by one, just a complex number, and then u is one by n, and d is n by one. <coughs> what I forgot to say, so we said that W is invariant under the equivalent uh, relations, and the hyperkähler quotient is the set of all matrices. Um, uh, coming from edges. So, not the loops, the loops. A subject to critical points. of W and satisfying the equivalence relations. So this uh, you should identify as the hyperkähler quotient. So I, I just divide the moment map into a complex part and to um, real part. Actually, I, I'm looking at the complexified uh, gauge group. I'm, I'm thinking about GLN, and I just look at invariance with respect to GLN, subject to critical points of, of the superpotential. Okay? Yes? What is phi? So, <coughs> every node has a corresponding loop, and I just call it by a name. So I call it by a name, phi one by one. So maybe I should write here, phi is one by one. 
More generally, if the node number is k, then phi would, will be a k by k, a square matrix, k by k. Okay? More questions? So now we are going to see the minimal nilpotent orbit. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. Right. So, so in in uh, in uh, yesterday's uh, uh, talks, the quivers did not have labels. The, the discussion was general. Uh, the point is that within the physical system, if I want to understand a, a particular brain system, I need to know the, how many brains are in each case, and therefore I need to specify those uh, non non numbers. And this specification of the known numbers will give me a particular moduli space that depends on this input. <coughs> so I provide the integer data, this combinatorial data, I, I also provide how they are connected, and from here I compute the moduli space, and actually I compute two moduli spaces. One is the Higgs branch, the hyperkeller quotient, and the other is the Coulomb branch, which is this, uh, goes to the motion of the green brains between the uh, uh, blue brains. Yes, yes. Except that we have to be careful with the notion of a Coulomb branch. Uh, I'm not sure we would agree on the, the Coulomb branch. Uh, for the hypercalic question, for sure. Uh, you have... Yeah, th those are going to be uh, symmetries, so there's going to be a moduli space, and those symmetries are going to act non-trivially on this uh, moduli space. Th th those are going to be... Uh, so, um, in other words, if I'll have a, a set of functions on this hyperkeller quotient, those functions are going to transform in representations of those symmetries associated to the square nodes. <laughs> and we will see the example very shortly. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is to compute the hyperkeller quotient for this particular quiver. So, <coughs> what I need to do is to uh, first look for invariance under the equivalence relation. Now the equivalence relation is just a GL1 here, a C star that acts uh, coming from this node. So I'm going to uh, write invariance and the, I, I'll call the invariant M. M now is an N by N matrix made out of uh, D and U. <laughs> okay. D is n by 1, u is 1 by n, m is uh, n by n, and we get a rank condition, the rank of m is at most 1. Okay, so m is now a square matrix. <coughs> And uh, it's very good now that uh, we, we uh, mentioned the point, so answering your question, there's a natural GLN action on this quiver, and M transforms in the adjoint, adjoint representation of this GLN. <coughs> Coming from framing. And M is in the adjoint of this GLN. <coughs> Any questions? Actually, it's SLN, not GLN. Why is that? Because if I compute trace of M, well, first of all, uh, 
the critical points will give me relations of the form phi u equals zero, uh, ud equals zero, and uh, d phi equals to zero. <coughs> so the, the Higgs branch or the hyperkähler quotients uh, happens at phi equals to zero and u d anything. Well, I'll just say non-zero. Could also be zero. It's also a solution of those critical points. <laughs> Maybe non-zero is not the right word. Any values. which, because of the requirement for equivalence relations, is parameterized by values of m, right? So there is a ring of functions on the hyperkähler quotient, and this ring of functions are generated by m. <coughs> and Uh, the uh, m squared is equal to um, du du, but uh, we have the relation that u times d is equal to zero, and so this is equal to zero. So the uh, the moduli space, the hyperkähler quotient, is uh, given by the uh, set of n by n matrices such that, um, well, actually, it's not G. n by n complex entries <coughs> such that m squared is zero in trace of m is equal to zero. So this is the uh, closure of the minimal nilpotent orbit of SLN. How many people know about uh, nilpotent orbits? Very few. <coughs> okay. So, um, and now I, I'm doing here some standard computation uh, and that's standard in uh, Nakajima queer varieties. So I, I gave you the formulation so I need the superpotential in order to have the hyperkähler quotient, right? So it's an alternative way, possibly, to the, uh, having a triplet of uh, moment maps and getting the solutions to the moment map. <coughs> yeah, it's an equivalent way of uh, getting the same moduli space. Now, um, we, we have uh, uh, just less than two minutes, and so uh, the next thing I will say is that this moduli space, or the Higgs point, is given by green brains between um, red brains. <coughs> Let's see how it comes about. So it is well known that the dimension, quaternionic dimension of this minimal nilpotent orbit uh, is n minus one. And 
And in the brain system, uh, we started with uh, this brain system here. And what, what I need to do is to take this green brain, move it to align with the red brains. <coughs> so I'll do it in steps. So I'll just finish and then we will stop. Um, so uh, the, in the first step, I will just align all of the brains together. The green brain with the red brains. Now they are all on the same direction like that. And let, let me make a reminder that we are drawing it in the six and three, four, five uh, projections. The projection to this subspace. <coughs> as I align them, remember that these are five brains, so if I think of seven, eight, nine as coming out of the board, now the uh, green brains can move away from the board, and I'll have, since there are n red brains, there will be a uh, n plus 1 uh, segments. n minus 1 segments where they are free to move. And one, the last one here is uh, stuck. Cannot move because it's uh, placed over here, uh, ending on the red. Here it's ending on the blue. Therefore, it doesn't, it's not allowed to move. Not up and down and not away from the board. <coughs> So now I'll draw the picture in 6 and 7, 8, 9. The red brains now becomes lines. The blue becomes points. And there are n plus 1 segments. N minus one of them are free to move. The dimension of the model space is N minus one, and it corresponds to the motion of each of those segments. Right? <coughs> so we, we recover in the brain system that the, uh, this uh, algebraic uh, description corresponds to the motion of those uh, green veins between red veins. <coughs> Any more questions? What is inherited from children? Um, not just. Uh, there is a, a, the combination of the a particular way we draw the quiver and the superpotential uh, brings uh, the hyperkähler structure, structure. Now, in hyperkähler geometry, there is an SU2, and there are three complex structures which transform under this SU2 in the three-dimensional representation. And uh, this SU2 is identified with the rotations. So if we go back to the brain system, <coughs> I have three directions, three, four, five, which are equivalent, so there is a natural rotation symmetry, SO3, and uh, the um, uh, dub double cover of it, SU2, will be identified with the uh, SU2 that acts on the Coulomb branch. <coughs> there is another SU2, which rotates 7 and 8, 9, and this is going to be the SU2 that rotates the complex structures on the Higgs punch. <coughs> right? So there are two SU2s. And I'll put a, a sub-index C for the Coulomb branch and another SU2 here for the Higgs punch. So I have two sets of hyperkähler quotients. Given a single quiver, I have two 
moduli spaces. Those two moduli spaces are hyperkähler. One is the Coulomb branch, one is the Higgs branch. So I should find two independent SU2s, and the two SU2s are the rotations of those directions. <coughs> now, in the, in the way we wrote it with the superpotential, uh, what I'm doing is to take such an SU2, pick one complex structure out of the three, define a notion of holomorphic function with respect to this particular superpotential, and then, sorry, particular, particular complex structure, and then with this complex structure, I write those complex functions. <clears throat> so now that I pick a complex structure, uh, A is a holomorphic function, uh, B is a holomorphic function with respect to the same complex structure, phi, and so on. Right? <coughs> More questions? <coughs> okay, so I think if there are no more questions, and please, if you have more questions, please come and ask. No, uh, we are no more questions. Uh, let me just summarize what we saw here. We first got familiar with the brain system. Using this brain system, we, uh, show, we saw how to construct a, a quiver, and from this quiver, extract a pluralized space by computing a hyperkiller quotient. Right? So, so we have a Nakajima quiver variety of type A. We could translate it into a brain system. We could also compute the corresponding Higgs branch out of it. Computation of the Coulomb branch is more complicated. I'll see what I can do in characterizing what it means. But this will be next lecture. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much, Ami.